very good morning to all of you ha uh, yeah house after a long time i am so happy to see that house is jam packed i should say or maybe more than the capacity we have so first i think i should say sorry for those who could not occur means get go get the uh, actual uh, seat of auditorium and they have to be on the stools maybe because response is much higher and it's really increasing because this first time we are celebrating this national space week we are we have been celebrating space week uh, celebrating this armstrong or yuri gangreen and uh, so many people from international uh, community when we come say space fraternity yes but this is the first time we are dedicating these days exclusively to the indian system or indian sega you can say. because you know the 23rd august last year it was declared that when chandrayaan successfully landed there vikram pragyan and then it was declared okay that shakti point i think all of you are aware i need not to tell much on that because nowadays um, people come prepared for what they are going that's a good thing and uh, so uh, last uh, seven six or seven days we have been organizing we thought this time since it is something our own celebration we should do it on a large scale and that's how perhaps uh, almost a week has been dedicated for that there were a lot of competitions programs workshops lectures and finally today is the concluding day because that was a historic day और अपना कुछ रहता है थोड़ा ज्यादा अच्छा लगता है बोले नहीं तो दूसरे की शादी में वो बोल रहे हैं बिगानी शादी में अब्दुल्ला दीवाला इस तरह का एक मुहावरा रहता है कि दूसरे के यहाँ कुछ हो रहा है हम भी अपना डोल बजाने के लिए वहां पे जाते रहे बट दिस इज समाइम वी आर सेलिब्रेटिंग आवर ओन सक्सेस एंड दैट इज समथिंग टू वी शुड बी प्राउड ऑफ बिकॉज एन ए वेरी शॉर्ट स्पैन ऑफ टाइम वी गोट इंडिपेंडेंस इन नाइनटीन द स्पेस प्रोग्राम स्टार्टेड समाइम इन सिक्सटीज मीन्स and then that is the history the first uh, satellite we launched is uh, 1975 aryabhat a model of which was made by some of the students uh, in uh, workshop day before yesterday so we have lot many things and now we are i think uh, what is called um, this said and we can say we are second to none means we are first second to none but that's the way of uh, beauty of english uh, how you expects or how you say those words which you do you want to say we do not want to say we are first but we say we are second to none mai hamare aage koi nahi hai so what does it mean i think uh, dr jeremon tell it can uh, tell it much better uh, so i'm really happy to extend a very warm welcome to all of you uh, for this very special day when you learn lot many things about and uh, these are the institutions for you are the future uh, if you get excited or motivated to have your career in space sciences and can cater to these institutions like isro perhaps that is our biggest contribution from the science center if one two three or maybe all of you can turn up yourself to and i think this is the best of stem education which we talk about is a bird buzzword now in science center in uh, scientific fraternity science technology engineering mathematics and now art is also added um so all these together make a very good choice so for a space science is concerned everything is required over there i think it is one of the best example for stem education okay so a very very warm welcome to all of you and to our special guest today to shri arvind paranjpe ji who is the director of nehru planetarium and also to dr ap jerman who is chairman of public science outreach uh, that uh, international uh, form is there and he is also chairman of steam academy thanks sir for sparing time and joining us now i'll invite let me first introduce you uh, about the speaker and those who are joining online also they are also uh, i would like to extend a very warm welcome to them as well Shri Arvind Paranjpe he is the as i told you he is the director of nehru planetarium he is part of nehru center next door i think all of you are aware we always have a identity clash with nehru center and nehru science center 
I don't know whether it is really it exists or it is the taxi people who deliberately do it because once you are either of place, then you have to take almost three, four kilometer extra turn. There is no way you can come. Maybe very soon we'll have a bridge connecting both of us. Then we can walk also. Um, Sri Panj, most of his life he has been interested in astronomy, and which accounts for his hobby, passion, career, and has been interested in various uh, other hobbies like stamp collection, uh, ship and boat uh, modeling, and photography. I think photography is something very close. Uh, uh, those who are connected with him on Facebook, you'll find he keeps on posting, taking photographs, either through camera or mobile from his balcony or from office and then keep posting some wonderful pictures. His profession career started as an assistant in photography laboratory of Indian Institute of Astrophysics, uh, Bangalore, sometime in December 1981. How many of you were born at that time? Not right. Maybe we were there. Uh, working in the lab, he uh, mastered various laboratory photography techniques spent two years in extremely arid Himalayan uh, region in the Leh region from September 85 to August 86 for two years. And during this period, he took a site survey observation for a high altitude infrared observatory. Uh, how many of you heard about Mopaku? Mopaku. Anyone who has heard about Mopa Mopaku? Okay, I'll tell you. It's good. This is the name of an asteroid number 17446 and it is an acronym which was discovered on 23rd January 1990 and named after three team members. One of them is Venkatachala Murthy. So Murthy is M-O. Remember Mo Paku. Okay, I will tell you one by one. Murthy, then Arvind Paranjpe. Paranjpe is P-A. So P-A is from there. And the third one is K. Kupu Swami. So Ku is from there. So these three members discovered that and it was named after having three initials, three names from those initials called Mopako. So it's a great, great honor for us. Uh, after returning from Leh, he was involved in search of uh, minor bodies in solar system. In 1988, he and his team became the first Indians to discover a new asteroid. It was named 4130 Ramanujan. And they were awarded Astronomical Society of India medal also for the same feat. For a short period, uh, he also took some spectroscopic observations. And then uh, finally, he joined Ayuka in 1991, April 1991. Then uh, worked on the development of low-cost instruments for astro astronomical observations. And first time I met him there only. And I always share this wonderful information. I was coordinating national this Indian National Olympiad program. And I took the team. And Dr. Narlikar was supposed to deliver a lecture over there in Ayuka. So we used to stay there for two days. One, we'll go to Ayuka and then going to GMRT for stay, sky observation. And so first time I met uh, Mr. Pranjpe over there. And I will never forget. And let me share it to you once again. Those who have heard it from me, please excuse me. During absolutely afternoon time, almost around 12 o'clock, which is very, very difficult to see any star except somebody bang on your head. But we have he has shown me Venus absolutely midday. After that, or maybe before that, I don't know whether it is possible again or not, but he said perhaps the conditions were so favorable, I could see it without any aid, without any telescope, binocular, with naked eye. Maybe if you are lucky enough, sometime you catch hold of him and again organize so that we can see it in broad daylight. So I think with this brief introduction and uh, interaction, I will request Shri Prajapaj to come on the dais. Sir. And I will uh, invite Miss Miss Tanvi from Pandey Girls High School to welcome Shri Paranjpeji on behalf of all of us here present to listen to him. Thank you, Tanvi. And now I think uh, we'll have many other things uh, programs as well.
but we can yeah afterwards some price distribution and some program certificate i can see many things uh, for uh, all of you here i'll request prank research to take over and start his deliberation so over to you. Okay, okay, we can start. Uh, thank you, Rastaviji. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me here today. And thank you to all of you who are present here. Uh, since uh, Rastaviji uh, told you about the Venus, so let me start from, uh, I think we had to go a few slides back. <laughs> Okay, this is my beginning slide. Uh, uh, let me tell you that Venus is the planet which can be seen in the broad daylight. Uh, and since 1980 or so, when I was a college kid, uh, someone showed me or told me at uh, that time I was in Bangalore uh, studying my BSc at uh, Government Science College and uh, amateur astronomers there uh, we used to look at it. And after that, every year, uh, once at least, I have seen the planet with my naked eyes. It is not difficult. You need a very clear sky and uh, you can see the planet. I won't go because we are already a little extra over short our time. So I won't go into details of how to see it. But I would advise uh, college teachers here and school teachers, teachers who are present here, that uh, Nehru Planetarium also offers a good lot of possibilities of attending our shows. For example, um, uh, for all schools that they, if you apply through your school um, uh, letterhead, we will give you a good concession to attend our shows. So we do that very regularly. So please do come. And when you come, if you tell me in advance, I will tell you how to observe Venus during broad daylight. And having said this, I will also tell you that uh, Venus now is seen above the western horizon. So when the if the sky is clear and if you go out uh, over the sea and look at the western side, you will see a bright object and that object is Venus. So uh, you will enjoy, you can see Venus with the naked eye. And uh, since... Uh, I do not have time much to talk about Venus, but I'll tell you, you might have heard that Galileo Galilei suggested or rather helped uh, the mankind to understand that the planets are going around the sun by observing uh, Jupiter and its moon. So he said that as the moons of Jupiter are going around the planet, similarly, planet, uh, planet must be going around the sun. But more than that, Galileo also showed that phases of Venus can be seen and uh, uh, you can see phases of Venus using a simple college telescope. The, those children who are uh, students who are from colleges, they know that we use spectroscope or telescope, Shota telescope attached to it, so you can see. Well, uh, with this introduction, um, uh, this be a beginning thing, I would like to tell you that uh, I'm talking about moon mission and Chandrayaan, etc. But information about moon mission Chandrayaan is not available on the internet. So what I'm going to do is I'll skip a few things and try to understand astronomical part or science part of it. Uh, we should understand that when we talk about astronomy, of all the subject, astronomy to very large extent and to some extent uh, meteorology, where the researcher does not have ability to perform experiments. With um, weather technology, of course, they have some possibility of doing a repeated experiment or holding their samples in their hand, uh, in their hands. But in astronomy, all you can do is observe. You cannot repeat experiment. You know there is going to be a total solar eclipse and that total solar eclipse is going to be unique and you only can observe it. Uh, if there is a moon eclipse which, I, which you can only observe it and you cannot repeat that. Similarly, Except for small samples which people have collected from the moon or in the form of asteroid or meteorites, no other sample is available in the hands of astronomers. Okay, So with that limitation, we have developed a fantastic science of astronomy, which we should keep it in mind. And uh, 
so i will try and uh, tell you something which is uh, basics of uh, this uh, uh, space exploration so uh, i would also like to tell you that the slides which are uh, which i am showing are uh, why uh, okay uh, slides which are showing i'm i'm thankful to one dr vinita navalkar uh, who is a, a scientist herself uh, did her phd from tata institute of fundamental research and she will be talking at the planetarium today in the evening so if you are interested you are you are also welcome so she will talk more in details about it but here because most of you are school children i will try to maintain the level of talk to that level okay so the question comes why do we go to the moon at all what is the need for it okay in the first place so why moon so before moon i will try and try to answer it that uh, let us begin with try and uh, asking this question why and how we are here okay this is connected to i will talk a lot about moon itself so why we are here and so what we see is that we um, we uh, owe our existence why we are here to a series of accidents without these accidents we would not have been here and the first accident is the water on the surface of earth which supposed to have come at the time of formation through large number of comets and meteorites hitting sur hitting the surface of earth and they brought water with it so remember water is a very important element in our our life uh, life formation without water possibly we would not have been here we need the water and therefore when as uh, astronomers search for life elsewhere in the universe they also try to look for more water molecules which are seen uh, in the universe now second thing that uh, i told you about is that moon it is believed that something like uh, 3.5 billion years ago a mars size body came and hit the earth and when it hit the earth okay now it, it hit the earth then the debris started rotating around and just in about one month's time moon was formed why i am telling you this is that when we do the lunar exploration and you will see there are such slides where uh, uh, sir how much time do i have uh, one hour so we can go up to 12 15 at least yeah uh, okay so what you find is that on the surface of moon if you take the sample we haven't explored moon as much as we should have but this uh, exploration is going on but you find there are certain features which are unique to the moon and some other certain features which are not i mean like there are um, features which are very similar to features on the earth or constitution which is similar to the earth and something which are on the earth were not seen on the moon so in some sense uh, moon is in that way moon is a unique planet then about 65 million years ago uh, something else that happened and then and what is we call the extinction of dinosaurs so why moon was important in the past because uh, we believe the astro scientists believe that life form inside the water and life evolves by darwin's principle by survival of the fittest now how that life which is form inside the water can come to the surface it can come to the surface cannot come without the help of moon or other i would say that moon has helped that life to come onto the surface because life form inside the sea water and sea water was that time a rather sweet it became um, saline because it brought uh, salts from mountains and uh, valleys etc and dumped it into sea so it slowly started becoming saline okay the salty water so life which form inside the water because of tides and tides which are generated by the moon so uh, life was thrown and those who started surviving they survive on the surface and eventually animals like dinosaurs came and where the dinosaurs uh, animals came they are very rare reptile and kind of uh, creatures they started ruling the land they destroyed uh, they destroyed vegetation they destroyed almost everything that there, there were carnivores herbivores dinosaurs and so on so they and when the dinosaurs were ruling the land nothing else could survive nothing else could flourish on the surface of earth then 65 million years ago dinosaurs died for some time people did not know why they died people had some signatures that dinosaurs were extinct but why people did not know and the theory is that possibly one another object um, uh, meteorite 
came and hit the earth through a lot of dust in the atmosphere. So when the dust was thrown in the atmosphere, it blocked the sunlight. When it blocked the sunlight, the grass or vegetation eating dinosaurs died. And so the uh, carnivorous dinosaur died and dinosaurs went away. But once the dinosaurs went away, the mammals and bloods, uh, mammals, mammals and birds started flourishing. And that is how so we owe our existence to them. Now, slowly human uh, humanites started coming onto the surface. They developed it. And as you see here, that in the northern, uh, uh, southern part of uh, eastern and uh, northern Africa, approximately 3.2 to 2 million years ago, some human-like uh, uh, people started uh, living. And then we had this Homo habilis who was a handyman. These people could make tools to you know, work, uh, make their life simpler, learn how to use fire. They not only learned how to use, fire was there because of uh, lightning and all that. So people knew that fire was uh, useful, but uh, they also learned how to make fire by themselves. So that was important. And then eventually we had two types of very close relative, Neanderthalus uh, uh, people who were sapiens, means intelligent people, okay, wise people. And uh, they lived, and we almost share something like 99.7% DNA between the two. We are homo sapiens, so we share with them. And uh, why they went away, we do not know, but some people think that we intentionally uh, removed them. Okay, so homo sapiens, that is ourselves, we came about 10,000 years ago. What it also says is that uh, they were wise, and sapien means we are just ourselves we are talking about. So that is how the brain evolved. Now, what you see in this particular slide, that brain started evolving and larger the brain, more intelligent you became. Okay. And then we were these two Neanderthals and uh, uh, I mean human beings. Now, why Neanderthals uh, couldn't uh, survive? It's basically, they were, they were in their small groups. They did not exchange too much of information with each other. They were small groups, whereas um, homo sapiens like us, we started mixing and we started expanding ourselves. See, that was I, I, the reason I'm showing this slide, you will get to know very shortly. So that is the quality of we as homo sapiens. Okay. And uh, the other two qualities which come is that we could talk. Right now, I'm communicating you, communicating with you with some kind of vibration in my throat. And I'm trying to communicate. I'm trying to convey my thoughts to you. Similarly, you listening to these vibrations which are there in the air, uh, your brain is making sense out of it and you understand. And then another thing that is most important is that our hands, the uh, first finger and thumb, they could touch each other. You see, there are no other animals. Are, yeah, you can try it out. No other animals do. And what this in a, what advantage we had by touching uh, index finger and thumb is that you could hold something and throw at a distance. That was a great advantage. And then not only that, the other advantage was this, you could hold a pen and write. So in that sense, we could start communicating with each other. We could communicate each other and if necessary, we could fight with each other. So that's what it happened. History tells you that... Uh, uh, I mean, if you jump about now, I'm jumping about 5,000 years. And history tells you that for our survivals in a small group, we also knew how to fight. We also knew how to communicate. And by communicating, I'm not just meaning that some information, but we had the uh, abstract uh, art of poetry, abstract uh, art of literature. You know, n number of uh, poems about the moon and um, uh, just a I mean, moon and sky and so on. So we could start thinking abstract. Okay, as you can see here, we built the pyramids, high level of mathematics, paper, and so on. See, when we talk about intelligence, and when you are talking, uh, talking about uh, to tell someone that I am intelligent, people have talked about various things that how can you communicate? Suppose there are some aliens coming from space and they want to talk to you, and you want to tell them that, look, we are intelligent people. How can you tell them? One of the possible things was, people have said, that value of pi. Value of pi is such a unique number that it cannot be generated naturally. It has to be generated artificially by intelligent being. Otherwise, you think about yourself. A simple Pythagoras theorem 
lot of literature has been written. Pythagoras, I mean, you have a right angle triangle and then you have a hypotenuse uh, and squares of uh, two sides equal to square of hypotenuse. Now, suppose you draw such a figure on the surface of Earth, then people coming from space, they would look at the surface, this figure and say that these people must be intelligent because they know about, about this. So these are various signatures which tells you that we are intelligent people. And of course, there are many other uh, discoveries. So in our connection right now, the uh, 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 the discovery which was done by the Chinese and what they called it is a gunpowder. It was a material which ignited okay, and uh, produced a lot of colors. So as you can see, and it was went to Arabs about 800 AD. So that in that sense, quite recently, less than 2000 years ago. okay, And this is where you find the complete literature about how to make gunpowder. And what that gunpowder composed of? Charcoal. Charcoal, you know, simple uh, coal that we have. Potassium nitrate, which they discovered. And also sulfur. Sulfur was available. So these are the fuel and oxidizer. And you could make something which would go up and uh, flare up. And it gives you some beautiful colors in the night. But uh, humanity did not end up that way. Uh, they also use this as a protection or attacking material, weapons. They use this gunpowder into the big guns and then they use it for fighting, either to fight or to protect themselves. Okay, so this material could throw projectile a very far away distances. Now, using this technology, one of the important, now this particular uh, document is, up, I'm told that it is available in the Na NASA's headquarter, which, is, which dedicates it, and that is, that Tipu Sultan and his father, Haider Ali, fantastically, they used this technology for the first time to make projectiles. That is, they used this gunpowder material to throw something which is far away distances. Okay. And that next slide tells you that it could go almost like 200, uh, sorry, two kilometers uh, for, uh, far from here. I've, how many, I mean, most of you have seen um, Queen's Necklace or uh, Marine Drive, right? So if you stand at one end of Marine Drive, um, the Babulnath side, and look at the other end, that is our uh, Trident Hotel and all that, or uh, that part, that distance is approximately 200, uh, 2 kilometers. So imagine in those days when you are only using bows and arrow, sending something that far away was a fantastic technology. And this has been uh, um, accept not accepted, but this has been honored by uh, scientists in NASA. So they they were able to do that, send projectiles so far away. Well, uh, when this uh, wars and fight were going on, we go somewhere a few thousand kilometers north uh, west of India and talk about this gentleman, Giovanni Schiaparelli. Schiaparelli was a wonderful astronomer and what he did was that he uh, uh, he had a fantastic telescope and he was observing the planet, uh, observing planet Mars. And when he observed planet Mars, he saw some lines, as you see here. He, I'm sorry, he called these lines on the surface of Mars, canali. Canali means basically in Italian, it was a channel, something which you can uh, uh, put a, a rod like thing, channel like thing. Uh, or, uh, but uh, this canali went, went into England and translated into English it became canal. And people thought that Martian are intelligent people who actually collected, uh, uh, taken water from the northern pole of Mars and brought them to the middle, um, that is equatorial region. So they must be very intelligent people. That is what people uh, uh, thought, uh, people talked about it, which was not true. Uh, he only uh, said there were streaks or lines on the surface of uh, 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 Mars. But there was one gentleman I should brought you to uh, the notice is Percival Lowell. Percival Lowell was a very wealthy person and he believed that there are people on the surface of Mars as intelligent as us or even more intelligent than we are. Okay, And they are creating life or they are creating habitat on the surface of Mars. And then he started talking about uh, various ways of getting water from northern pole or southern pole of Mars to the middle region. Okay, Mars looks very much similar to uh, Earth. I mean, it is one third in size, but Mars is that. And uh, 
This is how he started making drawings. Now, the interesting story is that for a short period of time, about 10, 15 years, there were amateur groups all over United States who would talk about um, uh, canals on the surface of Mars. So these people would, whenever Mars is seen in the sky, they make very good telescope, look at Mars, draw lines, and come and talk about each other. And honestly, everybody was telling lies. So if I tell lies and you also tell lies, I have to accept your lie, you have to accept my lies. Okay, so that is what happened during that period. And uh, people said, oh, we saw lines and etc. But actually those lines were, now people believe that if you look at look through the eyepiece, the telescope, you find some lines which you see. I mean, take next time uh, when you look through the microscope or telescope, cover it and you will find some lines. So maybe the lines were that. Uh, uh, this is what it says. So when your eye, it shows picture like this. Okay. But then uh, uh, there was another uh, science fiction writer whose name was uh, N.G. Wells. He published a book, a story called Wars of the World. And in this Wars of the World, based on Chaparelli's uh, uh, rather uh, Lowell's discoveries or Lowell's talk, he wrote this uh, story, um, this book, um, novel, which says that people from Mars came to Earth and this, they were trying to capture humanoids. Uh, they were capture humans. And beauty of this uh, uh, science fiction book was that Voice of America at that point in time ran a long series of radio talks. Television was still not there. We are talking about the uh, radio era where they... Uh, uh, had a series, you know, we have a, a radio uh, drama. So they ran radio drama series for a long time. And every day, every Sunday, they would say, okay, this is what Martians are going to do and etc. And then came time when Martians were about to attack Earth and people really got scared. And then people started phoning government that our Martian reals are really coming. But that was the beginning. That was a time when people started thinking about or, or that era that is, people started thinking about going from one planet to another. Well, uh, this is what it is. But this thing uh, excited this particular gentleman, inspired this particular gentleman, Robert Goddard. He was just 16. Let us see how many of you are here between age of 16 and 18 here. Just raise your hand. Let me see. All of you. Okay. So that is the age. The guy was that old, about that age group, where, sorry. So Godard started experimenting, uh, experimenting with rocketry. And he is uh, known for his invention. Okay, but there is another pioneer, uh, uh, Russian, okay, Konstantin uh, Teolovsky. Uh, he also uh, worked on it and he gave a lot of theories about how the rockets are to be made and etc. But I would like to draw your attention to Robert Goddard. This was the first ever rocket which was made and which we flew. And he did it all by himself without any government support or anything. All it was his idea. And then you can see that he built the first uh, liquid propellant rocket. Okay, I'm coming to this liquid propellant, what I have said just now, liquid and solid rocket very soon. But uh, point to notice that it was the first rocket which was made and which we flew. He actually took it to his uh, aunt's uh, uh, farmhouse where he put the rocket with his friends. And then this is the, uh, this is the um, channel uh, structure on which the rocket was mounted. And then rocket flew. It was 1920, more than 100 years ago. Okay. So what he uh, developed was I forgot to bring the rocket, uh, the uh, small toy that I have. But he also did something, use something called gyroscope or gyroscope. It is pronounced both ways. I have heard people pronounce it as gyroscope or gyroscope. Uh, okay. And this is a small instrument and how it works is as follows. That if you keep this rotating, if you make a uh, disc, which is in uh, this particular structure surrounded by and keep it rotating, then how much ever you upper thing you rotate, the inner disc remains in the same place, which is what he used. And this is what is used in rocketry sciences, where you generally ask when the someone is launched, then what happens to people inside? So he used this particular system. Okay. Then he did a series of analysis of rocket 
conducting conventional solid fuel rocket and then improved in three three test steps means what that you launch something after it goes to a certain height you another ignite something and then goes in three stages stages of it okay and uh, could be arranged now he talked about something called the level nozzle so now here we come to the rocket science that uh, it is go i'm trying to make it as simple as possible but uh, uh, here it is see you have seen probably um, uh, uh, in mumbai i am not too sure how many of you have done it but those who came from uh, or if you have relatives in a smaller city where most of the houses are single storied and then you have a some kind of a garden in front of you so you connect a hose pipe and if you pinch it the water jet goes too far away the water jet goes far away you might have noticed it or even in mumbai or you can try sometime that you connect a water pipe so you pinch it so there is a pressure on one side and then you make a small nozzle and you pinch it and this is what it is that here is a low velocity speed is low low velocity and then you create a high pressure and then somewhere here it's a what is they call it nozzle throat okay you pinch it means that pipe is pinched here and you end up getting high velocity and low pressure gas and this is something which is used in our modern rockets if you see the structure of rocket below the rocket is this particular structure and uh, you see that now the difference between the solid fuel and liquid fuel is as follows that in solid fuel here what you have is a sulfur sugar i mean that is what uh, chinese have discovered right i told you uh, uh, you know charcoal and nitric acid and so things like that potassium nitrate which is oxidizer and fuel fuel etc and uh, here what happens is it is just like our diwali rocket that you ignite it and once you ignite it it goes now you cannot control once it is once the ignition starts you really you just cannot control it has to be it has to get over by itself okay you cannot stop anything it control whereas when robert goddard used this liquid fuel liquid fuel if you have to imagine imagine like our gas stove or uh, 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 those who understand uh, slightly the northern part of it we use uh, um, uh, chulha which is made of coal or hot coal okay the stone coals okay so once you start you cannot control its heat but take our gas stove where you can turn burner you can change the speed how much ever you want so consider the difference between the two like that Now that if you make a rocket with a solid fuel so once it has started it just goes whereas when you make a fuel which is uh, made of uh, uh, liquid uh, material okay that is uh, liquid gases so there is a oxidizer and then there is a fuel which is uh, liquid hydrogen which is pumped into the cylinders okay and uh, then you ignite them so you can actually control how fast you can uh, it should burn so suppose it is going out of your uh, trajectory which you will see some uh, slide like that so you can actually control the uh, trajectory of your ro rocket so that's the difference well as i told you uh, one on this slide i could not help but showing you is the uh, rocketry sciences has invited hollywood and bollywood large number of uh, movies on that and here is one which is uh, rohan here who showed me that this is a beautiful picture which is dara singh and bhagwan dada those who are of the olden area would remember so there is a movie which is made by a bollywood where it was actually talked about the uh, exploration of moon and people going to it so moon is that exciting object and people wanted to reach out to it so let us see now a uh, few lunar mission the first successful in lunar mission was the russian mission okay uh, which flew on 1st of january 1959 so i'm i know uh, we had discussed just about some time ago so there are some people here who are either born or born close to this particular date uh, this is this date is after my birth 6 months after my birth <laughs> okay and then uh, okay maybe you can tap it it should uh, okay then uh, uh, lunar mission was successful uh, they hit the moon surface became the first man object to reach moon which came just about few months later then there were other uh, lunar missions which uh, were russian okay uh, uh, which uh, kind of reached the surface of moon 
And then we came to this Luna 10 that became first artificial satellite of moon and last communication. So you can imagine that at almost uh, two and a half months, this particular the object had become artificial satellite of moon. What, we would, what do we mean by artificial satellite? You send some object to some other planet or for that matter, uh, our planet also. And then that object keeps orbiting the local planet. And then at that time, we say it's an artificial satellite. But whatever duration it remains, it is an artificial satellite of that planet. Um, then they also carried lunokhod vehicles, which roped around the surface of the moon, Okay, which was the Russian thing. But if you take uh, uh, the Apollo mission, that is American mission, missions, American missions had series of failures. Series of failures, one after the other, say Apollo 2, 3, 7. Um, and uh, these were orbital mission. And finally, there was this Apollo 8 mission, which is lifted up on the 21st of December. Okay, with uh, I remember this particular Apollo 8 mission, uh, which was quite, by then uh, news channels were very fast. I think by then television, black and white television had come. So we remember that color pictures were uh, taken. But what that particular mission was important to us was, for the first time, we saw the backside of the moon. And then when we saw the backside of the moon, what we came to realize is that moon is highly craters on the backside of it. The front side, what we see is, uh, it's a, okay, has craters, flat area, but the backside of the moon is highly cratered. And what that is doing for us, Moon, I told you three um, uh, accidents, but there is one more uh, help of moon was that when the meteorites came towards our direction, the backside kind of protected it. Back, the moon took the bashing of meteorite and asteroids. So it's a highly cratered uh, object on the backside of moon. Okay, so what this interesting thing is that... Uh, uh, when Apollo 8 astronauts, they took a series of pictures, which you can see here, that this is how Earth looked. For the first time, people saw the Earth from the surface of Moon, it looked like this. And then as they orbited the planet, that is satellite, the Earth started coming up and coming up and like this. So that was how the Earth was seen rising on the surface of the Moon. At this stage, if I take a small pause and ask you one question, and that question is, see how, let us see how many of you can really uh, think of a right answer. Is that is from Earth, what we see is that uh, uh, sun, moon, planet, they rise in the east and set in the west, correct? Suppose you are on the moon, which direction you will see the Earth rising and setting? See, from Earth, we see moon rises in the east and set in the west. Planets and other things also rise in the east and set in the west. How do you? How would you see the Earth rising on the surface of Moon? Does anyone have any answer? You can raise your hand. Let me hear about it. Yeah. West to east. Anyone who thinks that it should be east to west? West to east, I understand because it rises from east to west. So exactly, it should be opposite. So west to east. So how many things? People think that it should all know why west to it, it, how it has to rise from east to west. No, no one thinks it has to rise from uh, east to west. Be honest, raise your hands and let me know. No, you are scared. You don't, you are not too sure. Okay, at least tell me that no, I am not. Yes, ma'am. You think. Okay, how many of you are? Not sure of either of answers. Raise your hand. Okay. Some of them are not uh, sure of their uh, correct answer. Actually, you know that we see only one face of moon all the time. What does that mean? That only one side of moon is facing earth. So if you are on the moon, surface of the moon, which is facing the earth, you will see earth neither rising nor setting. Earth will be somewhere in the sky, either close to horizon, in between, or right overhead. If you're in the middle part, Earth will not be seen rising or setting. It will be stationary, but Earth rotates once in 24 hours. So on the surface of Moon, you will see Earth rotating once in 24 hours. You will see phases of Earth, and you will not, neither see Earth rising or setting. I'm not blaming any one of you for giving wrong answers, but remember, 
henceforth at least that if you are on the surface of moon, it will not be rising or setting. Then what will happen to the solar eclipses? See, when we have lunar eclipse, that is Earth's shadow falling on the surface of moon. So when you have a lunar eclipse on surface of Earth, you will have solar eclipse on the surface of moon. Solar eclipse will be seen from surface of moon. Uh, moon. And what you will see is that Earth would be at one place in the sky. Sun will come from eastern side, go behind the Earth and it will come out. Why I said that is that because when Chandrayaan 3 had reached the surface of moon, unfortunately, the second time it could not wake up. But there was an idea that during that time, there was a total uh, lunar eclipse which was seen from Earth. So you, they could have, the Chandrayaan 3 could have seen the total solar eclipse from Chandrayaan. Anyway, so let me go ahead and uh, talk about Apollo 1. Uh, these people, they, you have seen the Apollo 11 crew, which landed for the first time on the surface of Earth. Uh, 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 Armstrong died some years ago. Well, so what happened in the, uh, in the case of uh, uh, Apollo 11? And Apollo, our Chandrayaan mission is what I'm going to compare now. So Apollo was launched from United States. It jumped up, turned around, went around the moon. There was one command module which remained, which remained in orbit. There is some another module which landed on the surface of moon um, with um, Armstrong and uh, uh, Buzz Aldrin. And it came back and it, they returned back to, back to the Earth. Okay. That was one technology that it was thrown with heavy weight and it jumped. What India did? Now we talk, let us talk for next 10, 15 minutes about Indian contribution. We, after the independence, we thought that we can't be remaining behind and we have to also participate in the, uh, or rather develop our own space technology. And uh, uh, we should do that. And that is how it was a very humble start. Rockets were taken on the surface, uh, sorry, by the uh, cycle, okay, uh, or backed on the cycle thing, or even in the bullet cart like this from one place to another. So that is how we actually started. And then over a period of time, we started developing our own rockets, a series of rockets, which I will rush through very uh, quickly. This was SLV-3, which uh, went up into the sky. You can check out. It was 22 meters long and solid fuel, etc. Okay. And then we had SLV-3, which is called uh, uh, satellite launching vehicle. It's a, it's, a, it's a rocket which would take the satellite up and then put it into the orbit. A very faithful kind of uh, instrument, uh, vehicle. Uh, okay, there is an augmented. So two things which are strapped to it. I won't go into details of this again. Okay, but then we talk about three types of orbits of these uh, 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 launches. Okay, one is it is called sun, sun synchronous orbit. Okay, that is a satellite is placed and it is synchronizing with sun as it goes. The orbit is synchronized with sun. The second thing is a polar orbit. So these satellites keep orbiting on the pole. And third are geostationary. That is the satellite is put in a such a way that it remains stationary with uh, compared to the Earth. So it remains in the sky. So advantage of these three satellites are three different advantages. Guys, girls, why don't you go out and fight? Or otherwise come on the stage, we can enjoy your fight. Come, come, come. I, uh, yeah, the one who is holding her nose. Yeah. I'm sorry I did this, but... Uh... I uh, see, uh, children, no one is stopping you. No one is asking you to stay here. If you really are not interested, you can feel yourself happy to go back. Or even if you sleep, I don't mind. But don't disturb, right? I mean, she's trying to hit her uh, neighbor for some reason. What was it she trying to hit you? It's okay. Don't do that, please. Thank you. So we are talking about the orbits of... Uh... Okay. <laughs> I, I honestly, I did this uh, a little bit with seriousness and a little bit with fun. I I understand that to some of you the topic could be boring. Some of you could no, may not be interested. That is perfectly fine. But those who are interested and in coming here, you see, you came all the way. So give respect to your uh, teachers. 
uh, even in the classroom, you give respect to your teachers and someone has come to communicate with you, pass on some knowledge to you. Either listen to it, uh, listen to that person uh, with uh, full respect or then go out. No one is stopping you. Okay, So get up and go out if you like. I don't have any, any, no issues about it. So just to tell others also, you happen to be scapegoat for a while. You, you are not the only people who are doing it. There were some other people too, but you just was directly in line of sight. Okay, so I'm sorry for doing this. Anyway, let's go ahead. So we're talking about this. This is a wonderful technology they're talking about because this technology is not only uh, good for us on surface of Earth, but eventually when you try to stay on the surface of Moon, uh, then also this technology would be used in one form or the other. Uh, Rohan, did I give you my uh, pen drive? Pen drive, okay. So uh, let, let, let us go ahead quickly. Now here is where there are these orbits which are which is following the uh, surface of uh, uh, surface of uh, so, I mean the remaining stationary with respect to Earth. Now what is the advantage of it is that you can continuously keep looking at one point or one region of Earth. Like our um, uh, weather satellites, which keep looking and monitoring the surface of Earth and helping us to predict uh, uh, predict the future weather or vegetation and so on and so forth. Okay. Now, uh, this is the geosynchronous uh, satellite. Let me just go and talk about this Bahubali fellow. It is a GSLV-3 Mar GSLV Mar satellite, which actually took our Chandrayaan to the moon. Okay, and then you see here their comparison size. So, point was that from here to here, about something like in 25, 30, 40 years or so, we came long, long way. ISRO came long, long way from one point to another uh, and uh, achieving total indigenous success. The story here is also that when we started building this um, cryogenic system, uh, by the way, uh, the liquid proportion thing, what we talked about, is a cryogenic system. Cryogenic is a very cold um, engineering system, which you cool your gases to liquefy them and use them. So that's a cryogenic system. So we are using that. And uh, we came that long ago. And actually, the governments, United States, Russia, etc., they stopped us giving. And that was a bone in disguise because we developed our own system. And... Uh, uh, we achieved the success that we have. Now talking about Chandrayaan, Chandrayaan mission came up when we started putting various satellites at close orbit. It was but natural for the um, uh, ISRO and country to think about having Chandrayaan or someone reaching to the moon. And why we are reaching to the moon? One is, of course, it is uh, closest neighbor, but then also moon is the first step in going towards the interstellar uh, uh, travel. So Chandrayaan, there's a lot of things which you can talk about the design and develop, design, develop and launch an orbit spacecraft moon using totally Indian, uh, Indian made uh, launch vehicle, the preparation, the height and etc. which you will now find a lot of it on the, the thing uh, on the net. But now you see here this Chandrayaan uh, 2 thing, Chandrayaan model. You can, sorry, here it is. You can see the you can compare the height with the astro, with the uh, technician here, how large it is, and then how it is uh, kept inside the uh, chamber or other the launch vehicle. It is how it is fitted, and then this. Uh, I think we are I'm running short of time, so let me uh, quickly skip it because I want to show you some videos too. Uh, okay, so here it is. Now here I want to sort of. Uh, uh, give you the differences between the two launches. See, the first type of launch, what you saw, was for uh, United States of America, which they did for Apollo 11 mission. What was done was tremendous, with a tremendous force, the rocket was launched. In a few days, it reached the moon and it came back. Okay, And what was done is that uh, it was ejected with a lot of force. What India did to launch uh, Chandrayaan mission to the moon, or even for that matter, Mangalyaan, which was the first attempt. We were we made a first successful attempt to reach uh, the planet Mars. And what was done was that using Earth's gravity, the satellite or rocket was given force one after the other. 
one after the other. So every time uh, the rocket, uh, see, it, this is this is something called the elliptical orbit. Uh, remember, all orbits are elliptical. There is no circular orbits. Earth and moon also, uh, the moon also orbits uh, the Earth in elliptical orbit. Earth, all, Earth and all planets are, uh, orbit the sun in the elliptical orbit and so on. So it's an elliptical orbit. So what is done is that as the satellite goes up, it speeds, uh, uh, comes down. Then as it starts coming closer to the Earth and comes to its point when it is closest, a small push is given and the orbit is increased. Then again, it comes back, increase. And every time it is closest to Earth, a small at appropriate juncture, a small push is given so that orbit increases, speed increases. Of course, when the orbit increases, speed increases, orbit increases. And then it, when certain speed is achieved, then that rocket is pushed towards the moon or, uh, or, or wherever it is supposed to be going. Now, what example which I can uh, tell you is that, uh, again, uh, in Mumbai, I don't know where, whether I have seen, but I, I, my childhood was spent in North India, particularly in Jaipur. And we used to do a lot of kite flying during the uh, December and January period. We used to do fly kites. And one of the things that we used to do was to catch other people's kite is to tie a stone to a long manja, rotate it like this and throw it so that it falls. And then you pull down other people's. Of course, we were school uh, students and we did this for fun. But what was done here scientifically that you see here, or which you can do it now anytime, is take a stone or some heavy object, tie it to the thread, and then you rotate. Or one of the example is that um, uh, not a discus throw or uh, gola pick, you know, then where you have a, uh, a very heavy weight attached to a uh, chain, and then you start rotating and rotating and giving speed. And then after achieving certain speed, it goes far away. So that is this technology is something very, uh, something similar to that that you give a speed every time it is close and give it a slightly more jump. And then once you achieve a speed, you can throw that long distance. So uh, giving you a comparison, I was giving you a cup. How many of you have played Gilly Danda? We used to play a lot. Some of you have. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's another thing about Mumbai. I think those uh, uh, plays that we used to have in small cities we don't have it here because it's all concrete jungle anyway. So there is a, a Gilly Danda. It's a game where you put a small wooden stick, which you throw it and it goes too far away. So you can imagine that the uh, American way where uh, they use very heavy force and throw that small little projectile too far away. So in one force it goes. But if you do not have that force, you can use force of the earth to go far off this distance. So here it is, this particular thing, you can see this red dot is our satellite, which was launched from the surface of Earth. It goes to a height, uh, one, uh, as you can see, and then it will come closer and closer. I'm just shown two orbits to give you idea. Uh, after coming, a small push is given. It is called perigee maneuver. It is small push is given, and then it is sent to the orbit close. Now, remember here, that moon is uh, moon was somewhere here. We have to meet moon at some other distance. So moon was somewhere here. Now moon is traveling. And here what you find in Chandrayaan, this is about Chandrayaan 2, Chandrayaan 3 data I did not have. So what you find here is that this fellow slightly deviated for whatever reason, slightly deviated from its uh, uh, decided path. So again, a small push was given. Now here, even though it may look very large, but it is just order of few meters. It's not too much. It's a very, very small deviation. But if you continue with that deviation, you will miss out quite completely. So that was given. And uh, oops, okay. And then it go goes into the perfect uh, orbit. I mean, it travels. And then moon comes. And slowly, as it comes up closer to the moon, now you have to reduce the speed. So when it reaches uh, closer to it, another push is given so that now it is called the transfer orbit from orbit of Earth. Now it is put into the orbit of the moon. Okay, it goes. And now here, what you have to do is to, you have to reverse it. Now you have to stop it and make it orbit the uh, moon. And so it is stopped here and it is orbiting. And that's how it goes and eventually becomes a satellite of moon and one part of it lands on the surface. Okay, that was Chandrayaan 2 model. 
which was attached. There was an orbiter and a lander, which carried the Pragyan rover, uh, Pragyan and then um, uh, Vikram, Vikram and, uh, and Pragyan rover, which landed on the surface of the moon. Now here, just uh, that was, sorry, that was the landing site of uh, Chandrayaan 2. We were all, I don't know how many of us, but we were all watching this thing to on uh, on that uh, particular night. In the middle of the night, we were waiting for it to land. But unfortunately, as you see here, that just about few meters. Now, if I enlarge this, that you can see that everything has gone perfectly as uh, science or mathematics would define. And somewhere here it deviated. And you can make it, imagine that this is, if this is two kilometer, it is just less than half a five kilometer where we lost the control. And you know, rest is history, how everybody feels so sad about it. But then it carried a lot of instruments. Now, the reason for my showing this slide to you is that almost everything that was there as far as the uh, scientific instruments are concerned, which are there in this Chandrayaan 2, uh, Chand what was there in Chandrayaan 2 was Chandrayaan 3. People worked very hard over a period of time and eventually uh, they were able to land uh, on the surface of moon. Uh, exactly, uh, it, it is today, right? Yeah, so uh, to, uh, last year we landed. It was such a great thing, I'll tell you. Uh, uh, let me, I think I won't, let me rush through. These are all uh, uh, scientific payloads and all that. I don't think I want to go it. But here is something which I would like to share. That it is no more a single person's uh, uh, effort, okay, or single country's effort. We have seen two world wars, okay, and series of cold wars, okay. But now what with that we have learned that not one single country will be able to achieve the feat, okay? Uh, I mean, reaching the, the space uh, or explore the space, uh, space by themselves. The European Space Agency itself has 22 members to it. Then uh, NASA International Space Station where Sunita William is stuck up right now. It is a part where the United States, Russia, Europe, Canada, Japan, where all these are involved. Point is, that even for Chandrayaan mission, other countries have helped us, though the technology was completely indigenous, we had help from others. So international collaboration is important. And what we hear, you see is, the many a times which, have, which has been talked about is that uh, in case of Mars, that the cost of traveling by auto rickshaw is less than the uh, kilometer wise they're going to Mars. Okay. So cost efficiency will remain India's and its elite play the space club, uh, space, uh, space club moves from uh, competition to collaboration. That is a catchword now that instead of competing, collaborate for a better success. With this, uh, what I'm going to do is, uh, I have generally gave you a flavor of uh, the Indian space mission, talk to you about Chandrayaan-3. But uh, before I uh, stop, I just want to share a couple of things or two, three things about successful uh, Chandrayaan-3 mission when it is landed. A few things which we sh I would like to pass on to you. One is the uh, experiment which they did after landing and everything was fine. They had some extra fuel and they tried to jump up and come down. Okay. And also remember that day on earth is 24 hours long. That is 12 hours of sunshine, 12 hours, 12 hours of uh, darkness. On the moon, it is uh, 14, 14 days of sunshine and 14 days of darkness. So when the uh, Chandrayaan landed, it was just the morning on the moon at that point, southern point. Of course, uh, this one, uh, you must remember that we were the first to land so close to the southern pole of, um, uh, pole of uh, moon. And what we learned from there, a recent uh, researches which which are published, that when you see from the uh, sun's uh, sorry moon's uh, uh, surface, when the Chandrayaan uh, three landed on thing, it threw a lot of dust. Okay, and with the other experiments, it threw dust. So what uh, uh, scientists from ISRO they did was they looked at the sun and they saw sun halo. You know, uh, during this period, as the winter, sorry, uh, monsoon gets over, you will find halo around the moon or some kind of a moon or sun. So that halo was seen. 
and why that halo was important is by knowing how what how large that halo is and how um, uh, bright it is you can identify what is the particle size i told you some time back that astronomy is a subject where you can't do experiment you have to observe and this is what they did that they observed and find out what could be the size of particles of uh, uh, on the uh, that is uh, thrown into the atmosphere other very interesting result that has come up or uh, that has uh, been uh, found from the landing of the moon is that we have a lot of water water which can be used in due in future so there is a water and third thing is which is very recent about one or two days or uh, the paper which is published which says that the temperature below the surface not too deep about 6 um, cm below the surface the temperature drops down to uh, something like 100 degrees so if you are on the surface of moon in the southern hemisphere and then you uh, measure the temperature on the surface and just below 6 cm below the surface 6 cm or uh, i think it is 6 cm but it's a number the temperature drop, drop down by uh, drops down by almost 100 uh, how much it is about 100 degrees centigrade so that is a new finding and of course the finding of uh, water which we have seen so and there this uh, video let me see if it plays no can you tap it and see if it plays otherwise my ah, it is playing yeah this is the uh... This is such a wonderful image. This is such a wonderful uh, picture that comes to our mind is that you have landed on the surface of a, another celestial body and you could move around. There are some. Uh, you can, uh, we can play uh, one or two videos and then I'll stop. Thank you so much. I think I'll stop. You just enjoy the video. Thank you very much. Thank you. No, I don't need. Uh, uh, you can play this. You can. Can you play this? It's a lovely uh, video. Yeah, sure. Just uh, see these videos. They are wonderful videos. If you feel very proud, I mean, I'm feeling very proud of it. I'll tell you, last year on 23rd, I, I had to attend a conference in uh, USA. And it was a conference of uh, uh, directors of Planetarium. And uh, just imagine when I told you the international collaboration, everyone in our group, they were uh, um, Planetarium directors from different parts of the world, almost every part of the world. And they came as and congratulated ISRO. And some of them were even uh, interviewed by Indian press uh, online. And uh, they're feeling so great that we have achieved this. So uh, in the space club, we were welcome. So it is not that we have so like, oh, it's just India. It's not. We are recognized. So feel you feel so proud of it. <laughs> Thank you. 
Just one small uh, point. You would have noticed that solar panels were vertical on the rover. And that is because the uh, rover had landed, or uh, Chandrayaan 3 had landed very close to southern point. So there, what you will see is sun moving almost parallel to the horizon and so low. So that's why the solar panels were uh, vertical. Anyway, uh, should I take one or two questions or? Uh, yeah, I, I can answer one or two questions if you have. Otherwise, uh, we have, uh, yeah, anyone. Just raise your hand if you have any questions. Anyone? I have all, always said that it is a, you know, the question answer session has a very big problem. It has a starting trouble, but once it is started, it is difficult to stop. So if you have, we will not go on for we are already. Yes, ma'am. Sir, I have, uh, hello, sir. Yeah. Thank you so much for explaining in a uh, such a simple way. We are, know all the things, but you have explained it in such a way we can comprehend it so easily. Thank you. And sir, uh, I wanted to ask you what keeps you motivated to work on space? It is not related to the topic, but I just wanted to know. No, it is to individually to me or to the individual to you, sir. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <That's> it. <laughs> to uh, know the unknown facts, what you love, sir. I love nature, so <laughs> it's I, I say answer is I, I just enjoy doing it. I just enjoy doing it, and I feel really nice when people like you come and say that okay, it is simple, we could understand because I don't understand complicated things, so I understand only simple. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Sir. Thank you. I had one question that uh, first when you said that about Homo habilis, in that you said that they uh, they learned about the fire and they invented, they tried to learn more about controlling fire. So uh, the next stage of the human evolution was also. Homo erectus. So Homo erectus uh, had also learned to control the fire. So I wanted to ask you that uh, the next stage was already means sim similar to the Homo, hibel homo hibelis or uh, anything different. Uh, my uh, thank you for this question. Uh, uh, please sit down. Uh, uh, my understanding is as follows that when fire possibly was made by not one or learn how to use fire, not by one person, but quite a lot of people. You see, people were basically at that time, the flesh eaters. So possibly because of uh, lightning or something, fire got generated. Fire also gets generated by wood, wood rubbing onto another wood. Sometimes grass also generates fire. You know why fire, fire uh, forest fires which happen uh, by themselves. So people must have learned that you have a fire and then particularly meat which is cooked in the fire is more delicious and easy to digest. So these uh, habits must have come and it, it is not just one or two days, but it must have happened over a centuries of uh, um, uh, years. Okay, many, many years this happened. 
So your question is that this transition is not like uh, what, today to tomorrow, but very slowly over a large number of years. Does that answer your question? Sort of, yes. Uh, but that's all uh, I can say at this point in time. Anyone else? I think yeah, we, yeah. Yeah, we need to go home. <laughs> Thank you, sir, for this wonderful lecture. It was so motivating, so inspiring. I think the students have enjoyed it as well. Uh, so, thank you. Let's let us thank the speaker again. Uh, today, also we have among us Professor Jairaman, sir. Uh, he is a retired professor from BRC. Please, uh, I would request Jairaman, sir, to please come on stage. Uh, so... This is the first time we are celebrating the National Space Day uh, and for the last week for the last whole week we are having uh, many competitions uh, many contests and we'll soon start with the prize distribution ceremony before that I would request Jarman sir to have some I am not Jairaman, sir, but I would like to tell you that he is a wonderful person. I have known him for almost 20 years or so. And his science popularization books are so beautifully written. And he is passionate about teaching science. So that's a wonderful person we have. Let's give him a big hand. Why should an 81-year-old fossilized man come and stand before you? The reason is very simple. In 1970, I had the privilege of carrying the Rohini Menaga rockets to Japan. I stood there on the stands for one year, explaining to the Japanese people in Japanese language what 75-centimeter Indian Rohini and Menaga rockets are. At that time, Uchinura, Japan, was far ahead of us, and today we are far ahead of them. It was Dr. Sarabai who briefed me what I should tell to the children of science in Japan, in Japanese language. That was, today we have a large molecular architecture of space. In that time, a subatomic particle. In 1970, I had that rare privilege. Thank you for, for allowing me to have these fond memories. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Okay, so without further delay, let us start with the prize distribution ceremony. First is the Rangoli contest, which took place on 21st uh, August. Uh, third prize winner is Ms. Tanvi Deng Dengre, Y RFD Panda Girls High School. Congratulations, Tanvi. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Tan Tanvi, please wait. Uh, very recently, uh, Pedalite uh, company gave us some cards, which is a model of uh, Chandrayaan. 
just see the back side of it. So in addition to their standard prices, we have decided to give them this model. So please make this model and teachers, if you are present, you can come and collect two sheets from us. You can use this model for your, for your science festival. Thank you. Uh, second prize winner in Rangoli is Ritu Parmar from Padaya Girls High School. Congratulations, Ritu. And first is Angel Shakya from Navy Children's School. I think Angel is not absent. Okay, moving on to the painting contest uh, category A, the junior category, which also took place, uh, which took place on 21st of August. Uh, third is Laksh Padek from Camp. Campion School. Laksh is absent. Uh, Srujan Pradeep Kamble from National English School. Okay. Srujan. Congratulations, Sujan. And the first in uh, painting contest for category A is Ravani Snehal Pimpale from National English School. So moving on to the painting contest category B, uh, third prize winner is Jinat Fatima Mubin from Anjuman E Islam uh, Saif Tiabji Girls High School. Congratulations, Fatima. Second is Akash Rao from Navy Children's School, Mumbai. I think Akash is absent. And the first is Shaikh Arzu Sabir Alam from Anjumani Islam Sai Girls High School. Uh, we also had an online quiz contest on 20th August and the winners of the quiz contest are uh, two encouragement uh, award to Atharva Nilesh More from Kendia Vidalai ONGC. Atharva is absent. Okay. Uh, Kamakshi J. Valiga from Children's Academy. Uh, Atharva. Okay. Uh, second encouragement prize goes to Kamakshi J. Baliga from Children's Academy. I think he's also absent. Uh, third uh, for the quiz contest is Aditi Baliga from St. Rock's College of Science. Smiley. Uh, second, second is Smiley from Samarth International School. And first prize winner is Abhadi M. Amin Banani from RJ Chaware Primary and High School. So they are not from Mumbai. So many of the, it, it was an online quiz. So we'll courier the uh, prizes to them. Uh, so the prize distribution is done. Congratulations, all the winners. Uh, I have one uh, announcement for all of you to make. Recently, we have. Uh, started one more program. Those who want to do experiments, it's with the Marathi Vigyan Parishad. 
I think thrice a week. So you can find out from our website. Those who want to do, there will be some uh, three hours, four hour sessions, two experiments in each. Uh, and there is another one which is going on, which is called Certificate in Experimental Skill. It is uh, basically uh, in conformity with the uh, national education policy, which emphasizes more on experiments, projects, and hands-on. So those who are interested, uh, participants independently, either through schools or independently, those who want to test their experimental skill, or those who want to learn how to do the experiments, they can join us as per the schedule. Uh, find out more from that. And those who are interested, perhaps you can contact us later on also. Schools, teachers, parents, whoever. Thank you. Okay, so let us conclude this. No. no. Th thank you, sir. Thank you, Director, sir. Thank you, Pranjpe, sir. Thank you, Jadaman, sir, for coming here.